Well, good afternoon. I'm Representative Dave Pinto. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Child Protection, the Legislative Task Force on Child Protection, and I want to welcome uh, members of the public who are here with us. Um, reminder uh, that uh, our meeting materials, including our agenda, are posted on the Legislative Task Force website. Uh, hopefully, you can, you can find that, um, and you'll find some helpful materials there. Uh, we're going to start, as usual, uh, by having uh, the Committee of Legislative Assistant uh, call the roll to determine uh, whether a quorum is present. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Representative Pinto, co-chair. Present. Representative, or excuse me, Senator Johnson, co-chair. Present. Senator Housley, co-vice chair. Here. Representative Moran, co-vice chair. Present. Senator Champion. Representative Damon. Present. Representative Hassan. Present. Senator Hoffman. Present. Representative Krisha. Senator Matthews. Matthews is present. Representative Mueller. Mueller, present. And Senator Port. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dozeland. Uh, and uh, we, in addition to Mr. Dozeland, uh, we on the House side have um, Polly Sirkvenik, uh, who is with us on the prior committee administrator on the House side. Uh, Sydney Spreck has taken on another role. And so I thought, Ms. Sirkvenik, if you can just introduce um, yourself and your work so folks know, know who you are. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Polly Sirkvenik. I'm a committee administrator with the Minnesota House. Um, I have been doing this last session taxes, but before then I did early childhood with Chair Pinto and I'm excited to be back with a lot of the people I've worked with before and some that I haven't and learned a new area. Good. Thank you, Mr. Krenick. I'm so glad to have you back with us. And I know several of the folks I can see smiling uh, on the call on the House side have had the chance to work with you before. So, so glad to have you. Um, uh, let's a little bit additional business. We have, I think, two sets of minutes to approve. They were sent out to you all, I think, only very recently, like in the last maybe even 15 minutes. I think we thought that they'd been sent out earlier. So if anybody has an objection to them being approved um, right now, please speak up and we can do that at another meeting. Um, but otherwise, I'm inclined. I think they're pretty simple um, to get them both uh, over with. And of course, uh, uh, Chair Johnson, please speak up if you have concerns uh, at all as well. Um, but the first set of minutes is uh, from uh, June 15th of 2022. Um, and I wonder if uh, uh, often has been my practice to have the have my vice chair um, move approval. So maybe uh, Representative Moran, if you would mind moving approval of the minutes from June 15th, 2022. So moved. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, and are there any additions or corrections, or as I say, any objections uh, to, to moving forward with, the, with these members? So not hearing anything, all in favor of approval of the minutes from June 15th, 2022, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay, so those are approved. And then um, Representative Moran, if you would uh, move approval of the minutes from August 17th of 2022. Yes, uh, approved, so, so moved. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And again, any additions or corrections, anybody, or concerns with uh, moving forward with these? So not hearing any, all in favor say aye. 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 And I should have noted that was uh, of the motion, of course, to approve the minutes. And any opposed, uh, please indicate that. So not hearing any, so that motion passes as well. So we have the minutes approved from both June 15th and August 17th. Um, and so members, uh, uh, that's kind of a nice segue to uh, to then the rest of this hearing. So um, we have had uh, two hearings so far, and this will then be the third in a series of introductory hearings for uh, those of us on this task force to get a basic sense of a number of key issues in the child protection system. I wanna note that in that uh, hearing in June, we heard a fair amount about prevention. We heard about uh, the process of intake and kind of how, um, how different aspects uh, of the system work. In the August hearing, we heard about the court process um, in particular. Um, and then at this hearing, the plan is to hear uh, first about uh, the um, governor's task force that kind of kicked off a lot of uh, this work back in 2015 and recommendations um, that came out of that task force. It's been a number of years since those were issued. Um, but it seemed important to at least have members of this task force get a basic sense, uh, a bit, just an orientation of some of that work from that time. Um, we're going to hear from the Minnesota Indian Child Welfare Council um, uh, issues of, um, we know that, that American Indian kids 
um, are disproportionately um, uh, impacted by and representing the tribal welfare system. We want to make sure that we're respecting tribal sovereignty. So that seemed like a really important topic as well. And then finally, we'll get some personal testimony from a couple folks who we were scheduled to hear from in June. We didn't get to, but providing a perspective uh, of people who've experienced the foster care system as kids and also parents uh, involved in the system. And then again, I just want to make sure we're clear that these have been a couple of introductory hearings. We have not been able to get to everything we want to, or even hardly anything we want to in a long list of, in a child welfare topics. Um, but after this, the plan is then for us to focus on one or two uh, at a time, perhaps three um, specific issues to focus on. I want to note that um, one of those that there seems to be a lot of promise for is the uh, OLA report that recently came out, the Office of Legislative Auditor Report on Child Placement. Um, uh, by placement uh, in the system. Um, we were not able to have a presentation on that today. That was not a convenient time for the OLA. And we also, given that that's an issue we really probably want to dig into pretty deeply, uh, would maybe want to have a whole uh, hearing dedicated to that. And so I'm hopeful whether it's the next hearing or after that, and that's something we would do. Um, and I'll have to talk to Senator Johnson. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll kind of compare and think about when the next hearing would be and what the plan is after that. I just want to see members, we'll get a chance at the end of this hearing um, to discuss this kind of broad plan further. But are there questions or if there's anything that my co-chair, Senator Johnson, wants to add about kind of, the, kind of what, we're, what we're up to here um, as a group? Uh, we'll look and see if there's any hands raised or Senator Johnson certainly dive in. I think you're unmuted. Please feel free. Representative Pinto, I think you, you've nailed it on the head there. There's not much I can add to that. So I think that's the direction. So any other questions folks have, uh, would be a good time. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Um, this is, I'll, I'll just note, this, uh, this is a complicated area. Um, I, I'm hearing regularly, I assume Senator Johnson is as well, some of you as well, about all sorts of different things that we could be pursuing. Um, it's really important, I think, to Senator Johnson and me that we um, be narrowly focused so that we can make sure that whatever we work on, we can really be effective on and really pursue because there's so many different directions that we could go and there's limited time and limited energy. Um, so, so not seeing any hands raised, uh, we'll move on then to our first topic. And of course, if folks have questions along the way, please speak up. Um, but so our first um, presenter is um, Assistant Commissioner uh, Tiki Brown from uh, Department of Human Services to present on that task force in 2015 and the recommendations. Again, I want to emphasize, we've really suggested this be a pretty narrow and short presentation just to at least give us a sense of some of what's out there and to give us the opportunity, those of us who are interested to pursue that another time, those other times. So um, uh, Commissioner Brown, uh, I think you're with us and please feel free to proceed with your testimony then. All right, thank you so much. Uh, for the record, I am Tiki Brown, Assistant Commissioner for Children and Family Services at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And I'm here today to provide you with an update on the implementation of recommendations from a previous task force on child protection. So the Governor's Task Force on the Protection of Children began in 2014, October of 2014, and ended in March of 2015. The task force issued a report that included 93 system and practice improvement recommendations to the pre-court portion of Minnesota's child protection system. The tragic death of a child that was maltreatment related was the impetus for what has been characterized as the most substantial period of reform to Minnesota's child welfare system. After years of engaging partners and communities um, reviewing other state systems and consulting with national experts, most of the recommendations have been implemented. Those that have not are either out of the sphere of influence of the child protection system, weren't supported with necessary funding, or through implementation efforts, it was discovered that there were unintended negative impacts that couldn't have been anticipated as when recommendations were initially formed. We provided you with a document updating of the status of each of the 93 recommendations. The recommendations fall into a handful of systemic and practice domains. These domains are maltreatment report screening, investigation and family assessment, racial equity and disparities reduction, training, oversight of county performance, transparency, and adequacy of resources. 
recognizing um, and agreeing with uh, Representative Pinto that today's agenda is quite full. I won't go through the entire list, rather I will briefly highlight a few important recommendations that have been implemented to date in four of the practice domains and then highlight a few ongoing efforts of the agency. Most notable among the recommendations was the creation of the Child Protection Intake Screening and Response Path Guidelines as a compulsory set of requirements standardizing child safety focused practice throughout all of Minnesota's local child welfare agencies. As you can see on the slide and in the status update document we provided, these new guidelines address many of the 93 recommendations. Additional guidance for co-occurring child maltreatment and domestic violence, interview protocols, and other complex areas of practice have been developed and used to improve child protection practices across the state. In response to the recommendations, both investigation and family assessment have been, have been standardized as involuntary child protection responses to alleged child maltreatment. Interview protocols have improved and fact-finding is a required component of both responses. Minnesota's best practices for family assessment and family investigation guidelines noted on the previous slide was most recently updated in December of 2020. Commissioner Brown, can I just clarify something? The phrase involuntary child protection responses, do you mean that they're required, that, the, that this is how the system must respond to alleged maltreatment is to investigate and do an investigation of family assessment? Or, or can you just talk about what, what that phrase means? Certainly, in, absolutely. I, what you mentioned in terms of um, uh, required responses would be the involuntary. Thanks, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move here to um, the next slide, which is racial disparities. According to 2020 data in Minnesota, Minnesota American Indian children were 16.4 times more likely, African American and black children were 2.4 times more likely, and those identified as two or more races were 6.8 times more likely than white children to experience out of home care. Recognizing these facts, the previous task force made numerous recommendations related to racial equity and reduction of disparities. DHS has implemented or is in the process of implementing these recommendations, recognizing the, that work to address disparities is an ongoing effort. The Child Safety and Permanency Leadership Team has increased cultural competence and racial and cultural diversity. The leadership team has established reductions in overrepresentation and inequity in the child protection system as top priorities. Additionally, the division has created the American Indian Wellbeing Unit and the Children and Families of African Heritage Wellbeing Unit to provide culturally focused case consultation and technical assistance and improve policy, practice, services, and outcomes for children and families. In 2021, the legislature established the Tribal Training and Certification Partnership, or TTCP, at the University of Minnesota Duluth campus. One of the goals of the partnership is to institute a certification process to ensure knowledge and skills competencies in the Indian Child Welfare, Welfare Act practices. We continue to work with our tribal partners seeking to join the uh, American Indian Child Welfare Initiative. Red Lake Nation became an initiative tribe in January of 2021. The Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe is in the initiative tribe planning phase. During the 2022 legislative session, an appropriation for the Mille Lacs Band to continue initiative planning was included in both the Senate and House omnibus human service bills before session ended without practice. The band will need ongoing funding to finish planning and join the initiative. The training, the 2019 legislature established the Minnesota Child Welfare Training Academy as a partnership between the Department of Human Services and the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which was intended to enhance child welfare training. The training academy's mission is to train, develop, and support the skills, expertise, and well being of Minnesota's child welfare workforce while nurturing a commitment to equitable child welfare practice. Task force members have been invited to Roseville's, uh, the Roseville site's grand opening tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and we hope to see many of you there. Additional regional tra training sites have also been established in Detroit Lakes, Duluth, Marshall, and Owatonna. 
And uh, Commissioner, uh, we have a hand. I, did you were you just going to do that one last line line on line on this slide? Um, I was going to go you... to the next slide, but I can absolutely take so, a question. Yeah, so let's 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 have Senator Hoffman then. Uh, Senator Hoffman, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Um, when you talk about uh, two slides back, um, where in your reports are any anything of the intersectionality? You know, we know that. Um, there's 22 states that are still missing protections for parents of uh, parents who have disabilities and their kids who have disabilities in this system. And, and I'm, um, I'm wondering, uh, are you guys including the intersectionality conversation uh, with the with this data? And if so, what can you tell me about it? Commissioner Brown. Uh, Jamie, may I call on Jamie Sorensen, the Director of Child Safety and Permanency to answer that question? C certainly, yeah, um, Mr. Sorensen. Sure, Co-Chair Pinto and uh, Senator Hoffman. Um, in terms of intersectionality, um, the partnership with the Minnesota Child Welfare Training Academy is with the University of Minnesota and the department. Um, Dr. Tracy Lullaberti is um, an international expert on uh, working with parents and children with disabilities. She speaks um, all over the world um, on that topic. And so, um, as we look at the training and we look at the competencies designed for the workforce in Minnesota, uh, parents with disabilities and children uh, who are differently abled um, are absolutely a focus in our competencies and uh, in the curriculum and in the training and in policy uh, and practice throughout the state. Yeah, uh, thank you. Senator Hoffman, yeah, back to you. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I, and I, I just want to... Um, particularly I'd get to this there, parents with intellectual disabilities are reported to the child welfare system at higher rates than non-disabled parents. Where in your data here as you're producing this, we know that that exists, but I'm, I've, I've never seen it any, anywhere that this is ever being produced or, or presented to us because I think it's very, um, it, it's very important that we, that we also have that within our data set, right? Because statistically, when you, when you look at the, the national research centers that are doing it, I, the, the thing I just said, you know, a minute ago is absolutely true. But where's that snapshot in Minnesota and hence the conversation of intersectionality in our data sets? And, and, it, and your answer to me is, yeah, you're talking about it, but, but you're also telling me it's not in this report. Is that correct? Mr. Sorensen, if you're the right person. Sure, Senator Hoffman, this is a um, brief report on a body of 93 very involved recommendations, and so it's high level. I'm happy to receive the request for um, data relative to uh, parents being referred to the system um, and please. can respond back with, with that information. Yeah, please, please, please do that. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll emphasize that. Yeah, the, uh, the the agency was certainly directed to keep things extremely high level and very focused. Um, but yeah, um, if, if you could please uh, respond uh, to Senator Hoffman's question, I think we all would be really interested to know um, both uh, what data what data is available, what it, what it shows, and be able to pursue this. Um, Senator Hoffman, does that kind of satisfy what you need for now? Yeah, it does, and it just tells me about the our systemic look at people with disabilities within the construct of, of our data sets. And so I thank yeah. you, Chair Pinto, for bringing that forward. Yeah, thanks, Senator Hoffman. Good, really good points. Um, so uh, Commissioner Brown, I don't see other hands up at the moment, so we can jump to the slide you were you were planning to get to. I appreciate it. And thanks, thanks also for that 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 good question. Um, Okay, so because we are now eight years from the work of the governor's task force, it's important to consider that the child protection system as it exists today with the incorporation of these substantial reforms. Our continued improvement work is driven by stakeholder and community engagement, federal policy and practice requirements, the need to improve uh, child safety focused tools for the workforce, and a priority of outcomes equity for all children and families. A few specific areas of continued improvement include our continued implementation of the Family First Preservation Services Act, which is intended to reduce reliance on congregate care and focus on family preservation. There is a focus on maintaining children and youth in their homes, and when placement is necessary, prioritizing placement with relatives and kin. The agency has worked in partnership with the legislature to implement 
statutory changes necessary for the state to comply with the family first requirements related to congregate care. And now we're able to focus a little bit more intently on the prevention and family preservation side of family first. And as we focus in on prevention and family preservation, that work aligns with recommendations 61 and 86. Additionally, much work is needed to be done to reduce the inefficiencies and unreliable of the electronic case management system known as SSIS. By creating a more functional IT system, we hope to resolve deficiencies in SSIS, not only from the DHS side, but also to our local agencies that are seeking to focus more on practices um, rather than dealing with uh, uh, system issues, and then also focusing more on children and families that are impacted by the child protection system. This will require time and resources. Um, additionally, there are continued efforts to improve child safety tools through a safety framework project with the National Capacity Building Center for States. So that concludes our brief overview of the recommendations. Thank you very much for your time. And we are available both Jamie Sorensen as a director of child safety and permanency and myself for any additional questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Brown, if you could have whoever is running the slides, just bring them back up and let's go back. I think it was like your second slide that had the link to the report. I just wanna um, note this for members um, if we're able to bring that up. I'm not sure if that's on my team or you know, it looks like Ms. Sommerfeld. Um, Thanks, sorry about this. Yeah, if you can go a slide, one more. Yeah, this slide would be perfect, yeah. So I just, members, I wanna note that this, the hyperlink there um, contains multitudes. Um, so DHS was asked to just be able to give us just a sense as to what the task force was that resulted in the legislative task force to oversee these, these recommendations and the series finally ending up with our work eight years later, nearly eight years later. Um, but uh, these slides will be available to members and to the public, of course. And uh, you'll want to take the time when you can to click through and take a look at that report and those recommendations. Um, and uh, cause there's really a, a lot there and a huge amount of work. Um, I believe that Representative Moran was on that task force. I could be wrong about that. Um, and Representative Moran, if there's anything that you wanted to say at this point, um, feel free to, to, to dive on in. I could be wrong about that, but I thought that you were. Um, yeah, yeah. Co-Chair co co uh, Pinto, thank you. I was not yeah. on the original task force. Okay. But I have been interested and engaged since the, uh, um, since the um, beginning of that task force in response to uh, the child welfare system, you know, home protection and what was going on. Thank you. I, yeah, I recall you were on the task force then oversaw the, the, the implementation. The yes, once it became, yes uh, uh, once it became the legislative task force, um, I became a part of that process. Yeah. Perfect. Good, good, good. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and then members, I'll also note that not all 93 recommendations have, have been implemented is my understanding. And Commissioner Brown, you may have gotten to this, but I don't know if you did. Um, but there are some that I think in, in the subsequent years have found that they couldn't be implemented for some reason, or perhaps uh, some questions as to race is where they should be. Um, uh, and, and with the passage of time, this is a good historical look, and then now we're going, going forward. Um, so I just wanna see uh, members whether there are uh, anything anybody wants to ask further about that this part of our work i am not seeing other hands raised um or other folks on muting and so i really really appreciate the orientation commissioner brown that you've um that you provided and, and Ms. sommerfeld um uh, as well mr Sorensen, for their work so one more second here not seeing anybody so okay thank you so much really appreciate it thank you um so we'll next bring up uh, our folks from the indian child welfare council um uh, I believe that the first person is going to be uh, Tony Strange Savage, um, though if Ms. York is going to be going first, uh, whoever it is, uh, we'll have you start and, and please introduce yourself and then begin your presentation. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tony Smith Savage, um, Social Services Coordinator for Fond du Lac. Um, so today we were asked um, to uh, present as co-chairs of the Advi American Indian, um, Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council. Um, and so I would like to just kind of share, and I'm, I'm uh, kind of new at sharing my screen, but you can see um, the screen. So let's see, through Minnesota Indian uh, Family Preservation Act dollars are allocated to support Indian 
urban organizations and tribal social services. The funding is statutorily allocated through the Department of Human Services, and the amount has not changed since the inception of MIFA, which um, was in the inception was 23 years ago. The Advisory Council would like to recommend an increase to these grants as the current amount woefully under supports the work of tribes and the Indian urban organizations. As stated in the OLA report, ICWA applies to children in approximately 19% of removals in Minnesota. The OLA report re also shares data regarding the racial disproportionality. The report states American Indian children were, like Tiki Brown had said, 16.4 times more likely than white children to experience out-of-home placement based on Minnesota population estimates from 2019. The report also provides an analysis of funding available to county social services agencies, but does not explain the funding for tribes, urban Indian programs, and urban Indian tribal programs. So what we have here are the different uh, grant types that are offered. So there's the primary funding, which are directed to support tribal on and off reservation agencies and Indian urban organizations. This funding is for four years. Then there's a special- Ms. Savage, Savage, can I just interrupt you? Could, would you mind, and maybe you did this, um, but if you could just expand just a bit for folks who are brand new to this, that um, to say what ICWA is and sort of just, and perhaps you were gonna get to this, um, but just to be sure that people are really grounded in, 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 in ICWA, if you, if you wouldn't mind. So the, the uh, American Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council um, was a council that was put together in response to ICWA and needing to follow, follow the federal law of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Of, um, and so our council consists of 17 members, which includes representatives from each of the 11 Minnesota reservations and urban, um, one representative from the Duluth urban area, and then three representatives from Minneapolis, um, and two from the St. Paul urban Indian community. Um, uh, good, yeah, and, and so, so it was this federal law that, that recognizes uh, the particular need uh, uh, to address um, concerns uh, about disproportionality for American Indian kids and, and the sovereignty of tribes uh, in the child welfare system. Am I, am I saying that right? Yes. And, okay, um, and, and I would just like to add, Buju, everyone. My name is Laurie. Oh, York, and I'm the ICWA Advisory Council co chair. Ms. York. Added... Yep. Please. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I would just like to add in that, um, it, yes, the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act is a federal law that is um, primarily for states and county agencies to follow. And in that, you know, talks about preventive efforts active efforts, and then also placement preferences um, to really help prevent that placement and keeping our children and families together. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, and sorry to interrupt, um, Ms. Savage. I just, uh, for many of us, this is not our area of expertise. I just want to make sure people are, are fully grounded. So please continue with the with your slide. Okay, thank you. So the, the, tribal, um, the tribal and special focus uh, tribal primary and urban primary uh, funding um, is funding um, that is not competitive. However, the special focus funding is competitive, and that's designed to support tribal social services agencies and Indian urban organizations and funds them for two years. Um, the maximum award for this funding is uh, 100000 a year. Um, so the funding is provided through competitive grant funding. Um, RFPs are offered usually by the end of October until the end of November, and then it's reviewed. Um, the advisory council takes a look at um, the different awards, um, and then we, we work with DHS ICWA unit to um, develop the contract. So the other part of the funding um, is that part called compliance, which, um, this one supports the public defense corporations, such as the Equal Law Center. Um, so the, the money there is appropriated to support and provide the activities that support their mission, which is to strengthen and preserve and reunite Indian families consistent with mandates, um, you know, as Lori was explaining, um, and following the spirit of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So 
So this next slide explains a little bit about the services that um, we can provide under the funding. Um, and so as you see, um, we've, we've got, this is a lot, a lot of work that tribes do is they do placement prevention, reunification, family-based services, crisis intervention, counseling, foster and adoptive placement resources, um, court advocacy, training, consultation, um, transportation services, and other activities related, related to services provided by um, and approved by the commissioner that further the goals of ICWA and MIFA. Um, and so, and then there are other uh, things that the funding cannot be used for, um, which is things like child care, foster care maintenance, um, funds do not come out of this funding, residential facility um, payments and adoption assistant pa assistance payments. Um, so it's, it's pretty narrow. Um, the next slide kind of shows a little bit about how the formula um, is allocated. So every year, um, it, it's, we're looking at 1.482 million of state dollars each year. Um, the primary grants, as you can see, um, most of that will, 70% of that goes to the tribes, and then each tribe receives a 5% base allocation. Uh, the remaining dollars are then distributed based on federal census population. 30% uh, of the primary grants go to urban programs, and then the urban programs um, are reviewed um, and then we're, they're funded through the ICWA Advisory Council's approval. Um, and then we've got the special focus grants, um, like I'd said, uh, that are two years in length. Um, and the amount in agency funded is based on recommendations of, of those proposals um, and approved by the ICWA Advisory Council. And that is the okay. last slide on my part. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, Smith Savage. And so, um, Ms. York, uh, we've heard, I guess you've introduced yourself. So please just uh, dive on in. All righty. Thank you. So, um, currently, the, there's um, ICWA specific training that's offered, um, offered throughout the state of Minnesota. The Tribal Training Certification Partnership provides. Um, a training for new social workers within counties, as well as training within tribes um, and also guardian ad items. So CJI um, also provides training throughout the Children's Justice Initiative for judges and attorneys. And so what um, the TTCP in Duluth and the Children's Justice, Children's Justice Initiative are collaborating to ensure that the training is consistent and then also that they're really training on the efforts of the true intention of, of, of ICWA, so the Indian Child Welfare Act. And the Indian Child Welfare Act is, is known um, as the gold standard that really um, focuses in on those prevention efforts and then also keeping our children and families together. And the, um, the training need that we have identified that is also identified in the OLA report is um, it's very specific to uh, law enforcement. So we know that law enforcement, they, they make critical decisions um, within the child protection and welfare system. And these in individuals are making placement decisions, um, sometimes placing holds on children in the beginning and then becoming involved um, with the Indian, child, Indian children and families um, because law enforcement is working with many families on the front end and we have to have a, a you know, we have to have them trained in understanding what the federal law is, the Indian Child Welfare Act, which would help all children. And this impact that law enforcement is um, doing when they're, when they're meeting with their families can be very traumatizing and detrimental to the child well-being and having um, long-term effects to the family. So the Indian Child Welfare um, Advisory Council is proposing funding to support ICWA specific training for law enforcement. Um, it's important for police to, to understand how their job is impacting the field and then how it relates to tribal relations um, and how our political status um, Im impacts the decisions that they're making. And then having an understanding and partnering about jurisdiction and knowing the responsibilities for the families that have dual citizenship in those areas. Um, the area of concern has been longstanding and the request from the 2015 tribal legislative um, to the, the, the 
request came from out of the 2015 recommendations. Um, we, we, as the advisory council came together and had a 2018 tribal visioning session. And from that um, tribal visioning session, we had seen these gaps in, in, in services and areas. And since then, since uh, 2018 and 2019 visioning session, that's what led to the tribal training um, uh, certification and partnership through the University of Minnesota Duluth and also the Children's Justice um, Initiative, CGI, with their training. And so since then, we've been able to train judges or judges, attorneys um, through CGI in collaboration with the TTCP at University of Minnesota Duluth, who is training the social workers and guardian ad litems. So for the first time, we've had consistent training on what is this federal law, Indian Child Welfare Act. And the, the barrier or the gap in that service was that law enforcement who was making this critical decision point of um, placing the children, not knowing this federal law and the impacts that it has on, on all, tri all children in Minnesota. And um, uh, the, the Casey Foundation um, at a national level has recognized that the Indian Child Welfare Act really is the gold standard for child welfare and really does focus in on, on some of our prevention services. And, and um, when we do those prevention services, that really does save money long-term down the road rather than being a response system of, of having to pay all these additional, um, um, you know, all this other funding for follow-up on the trauma that was created. We have to put more towards prevention efforts. But um, one of the areas that we could really use your assistance and support and would really be that training for law enforcement, which is also identified in the OLA report as well. And that concludes our, our PowerPoint and we would just leave it up for questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to you both. Um, members, questions uh, about uh, what we've seen or other questions uh, for the folks from the uh, Indian Child Welfare Council? Just looking to see if there are any. You can maybe you can take down the the presentation if you don't mind. And uh, we'll just see if there are any. I don't know that I'm seeing any questions or hands at all. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry, Senator Johnson, you're unmuted at least. So please, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, Representative. Sure, I'm sure. trying to find my raise hand feature oh, here. I, I just need to look. That's all right. So yeah, uh, please, Mr. Co-Chair, go for it. No, I, I just wanted uh, on your uh, slide there where you talked a little bit about the law enforcement training. Uh, what were some of the the recommendations? I mean, just just kind of a quick overview on um, a couple of different things uh, that that maybe you'd be seeking from uh, law enforcement. I'm just uh, curious on on the interaction that you might be seeing on that. Yeah, let's. Um, so, um, Ms. York, please. Alrighty, so um, what we what we see right now, like boots on the ground, what we see is law law enforcement does not even know what Indian Child Welfare Act is, and oftentimes when they place a hold, um, they defer over they they defer to the social service agency, and if they don't know that when they're coming um, in contact with the Native American family, they don't have that understanding of the importance of placing that child with the, the parent. And also they don't know the difference between, uh, you know, dual citizenship and also having our own political status and that our children are protected under the special federal law. However, it would, if all law enforcement was trained on the spirit of ICWA, it would be beneficial to all children in Minnesota because all children in Minnesota should have active efforts. They should all be placed with family members, if at all possible, to reduce the trauma onto the children and, um, and really keeping our families together whenever possible. So, uh, you know, it being recognized as a gold standard um, at a national level, it really would benefit all children if law enforcement was specifically trained in the federal law Indian Child Welfare Act. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure, Johnson. Follow up. Yeah. Yeah. If I if I could just real briefly. Um, so right. with with that, are you seeing most of those issues that are happening uh, outside of uh, of the reservation area? Are most law enforcement agencies within that are very well versed, maybe in in ICWA, but outside, maybe if you're down in the uh, metropolitan area where a lot of the tribal members reside. Um, is, is that kind of where you've seen some of the problems or I'm just curious on, on where that might be more prevalent. Ms. York. Yeah, Ms. York. 
Thank you. So I'm glad, thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. So White Earth Nation, Leech Lake, Red Lake, and um, soon to be Mille Lacs will have uh, the jurisdiction on their reservation. And when we're talking about jurisdiction on our reservation, we operate a little bit differently. So on reservation, we as social workers actually go out and make these determinations. It is not the law, a law enforcement or police officer. So yes, you are correct. This oftentimes is seen when it's off reservation because when we move, when we go outside of our boundaries specific to the four initiative tribes, then it's law enforcement that's coming in contact with their families first. It's law enforcement that's making the decisions to place a hold on the child. And uh, it looks like Chair Johnson, looks like you may be all, all done. Uh, yeah, okay, and, and Ms. York, I'll just follow up to ask. Uh, you said that that was a recommendation from a legislative auditor report. Is that the recent one on child placement that they made a recommendation for this ICWA training for law enforcement or was it a diff different one you're referring to? So I am, thank you. Um, yes, I am referring to the Child Protection Removals and Reunification OLA Evaluation Report of 2022. And yep. in there, um, it says local child protection agencies and law enforcement have substantial discretion to make child removal decisions. And then it says that um, law enforcement um, has no state requ requirements for ongoing training. So if there was an ongoing training that would be really beneficial to all children, really would be that training on the federal law, Indian Child Welfare Act. And, and uh, I know that the TTCP is more than willing to assist in that training if there was funding for law enforcement to receive that ICWA training, which would also be the importance of consistency with um, CJI, guardian ad litem, social workers, attorneys. And then now if we could um, bring in that opportunity for law enforcement, you would have a consistent training through the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Good, and, T and TTCP again means? The Tribal Training Certification Partnership. Got it. Okay. Good. Thanks. We're uh, yeah. We're all we're all kind of we we don't work in this field, so we kind of need to have those things to find. I did see um, Representative Moran's hand raised briefly, uh, and so and but she took it back down. Representative Moran, please, if you have something, to dive on in. Thank you, Co-Chair Pinto. My question was going to be within what should law enforcement officer be doing? Mm. So if they are huh. trained, can you tell us what would happen in the case when they encounter um, a native child been removed from the home? if they are trained in the process. And, and can I just, and uh, before you answer, Ms. Jordan, Representative Moran, thank you for the question. And I, it seems to me that this question not only addresses what you've been talking about, Ms. York, but I think maybe gives some of us who don't work in the child protection field, child welfare field, just a sense of the real, of the reality. So so how, mm -hmm. so what is the answer to Representative Moran's question? How, how what, what, what should a law enforcement officer do? So from, from my perspective in this experience, a lot of times we would have uh, different people going into the home, such as a law officer, and they could go into a situation and without the training, um, they would miss things like what could be preventing some of the issues. So let their, their mindset or what they see going into the home oftentimes is for criminal activity. So if they see something like if they see drugs or something there, it, they're thinking more so is there enough to charge and is there enough to arrest and that type of thing. However, if they go in after they've been trained on Indian Child Welfare, that specific act, they could see things that say, okay, well, I do have concerns. Um, this may not be to the level of, of charge, but I'm going to report this over to social services to see if they can do some voluntary work or some other work with the family before it turns into imminent danger or harm. But so if they were specifically trained from a view of um, th that social work, that social work view, they would see what they're going into it from a different lens. In addition to that, having the understanding that if they're going to place a family member or place a child, they may then if they're trained on ICWA, they could say, well, are you of a tribe? Uh, do, can we contact your tribe? Can, does the tribe have a relative person that's licensed? Um, the other thing they could do is, is um, identify family members immediately on scene so the kids aren't then going to a child protection agency or a, uh, like a, um, the, the St. Joe's home or those types of things. We could eliminate those things by identifying other family members that could be licensed if they were knowledgeable of that process. That's really helpful, Ms. York. Thank you, um, Representative Moran. I don't know if you have a. So you're unmuted. You're, you're muted. So I figure you may be maybe all done. But um, um, or Representative Moran, anything? Yeah, I just want to say thank you. That's a, a good response, um, 
yeah. to that, that helps allow us to see what will happen, you know, in that type of case. So thank you, Ms. York. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. York, and, and thank you again, Representative Moran, for that question. Uh, I think members, it's um, we can we talk about at broad level and grants and various things, and then there's that moment of your police officer, you're standing there, there doesn't, you know, you're trying to figure out what to do, um, and that's um, that's critical um, that folks be making be be trained to make the right decisions. Um, I don't see other questions uh, or other hands raised, uh, and so um, thank you so much uh, to both of you for your work, your really important work. Um, for um, for American, American Indian kids in Minnesota, and and um, and please uh, continue to keep in touch with us, and we'll keep an eye on uh, your proposals and everything else. So thank you, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good. And then finally, members uh, for our third section this morning. Um, again, we're going to hear from two folks who had been scheduled to speak in June, and we weren't able to get to them at that point, but to provide a bit of perspective, uh, uh, children in the system and parents uh, engage, engaged in the system. And so the first person that we have up is uh, Huang Murphy, um, who's the founder and executive director of Foster Advocates. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Murphy, it's so good to have you with us. And please uh, uh, unmute and uh, introduce yourself if you can, and then proceed um, with what you have to share. Great. Thanks for having me this afternoon. I'm very excited to be before the committee today. My name is Huang Murphy, and I'm the founder and ED of Foster Advocates. So uh, I was asked to just jump in a little bit and speak about you know, the experience of foster care and provide a window of what it's like to be impacted by the foster care system. And so I would just love to share a little bit about my perspective and then answer any questions that folks might, might have. But uh, you know, really just my story started off uh, when I entered foster care. Uh, I was eight years old. It was my first week of school. And when I say first week, you know, I don't mean like the first week of the school year. I literally mean, literally mean my first week of school ever. Uh, I had been asked to go to school. Like I, I had been asking to go to school since I, I discovered it was a thing that other kids did. Um, and after months of like really just being persistent about it, it was finally my time. It was third grade. I was in my favorite outfit. Uh, it was my only outfit. Uh, my forest green sweatpants and a matching shirt. Uh, and I wore it for the entire week. But I was even more excited about something else I discovered while I was at school. This really amazing thing that they had called school lunch. I got a meal every day. And that was so wild to me. I'd never seen so much food all at once. I ate everything. Everything got my seal of approval. Five out of five stars. Uh, I think it was about this point that I think the adults at the school and the teachers saw that something was off. Uh, maybe it's because my teacher caught me stashing food that was in the garbage in my pockets or because my shirt really didn't cover much of my bruised or emaciated stomach. But on that Friday uh, of that first week, um, you know, someone took my brother and I out of class and brought us to an emergency shelter. Uh, we would see our biological father about a week later and then every other weekend. Uh, and then two years later, not at all. We were adopted soon after I turned 11. And so the challenge here is that according to my former guardian, Child Protective Services or the state, so in a way, all of us, uh, this was the end of my story. I was no longer under the state's care. And as, and as a result, there's no further record of me. So after a child is adopted, after a child is returned home, uh, or after the age out of the system, states and corresponding agencies are no longer held accountable for that child and no data is recorded of folks who have received foster care. The state doesn't know if they made a good choice with my adoption. They also don't know that, as with many fosters, our brother's outcomes were far less positive. That while I was at Syracuse, my little brother was at St. Cloud State Penitentiary. And so, I pause here to just say that the child welfare, the child welfare system, frankly, uh, couldn't do a better job if its goal was to harm children and families. Because for too many who are in crisis, <laughs> the cure is almost in, indistinguishable from the poison. And you know, the worst thing about foster care is not necessarily that uh, most of us end up in jail or homeless. It's that it doesn't allow us any position to imagine uh, you know, it doesn't allow for us to really think about what the future could look like. Because once we enter the child welfare system, childhood is 
disrupted. You know, at the point in life when young people are most creative, and the natural consequence is that you can't imagine anything beyond what is right in front of you, what is most present. You know, our next meal, our next pl safe place to sleep, the next job, the next person. Uh, we can't imagine a future that is full of hope. So we limit our dreams to things that we know to be true, just survival. And so in a way, I guess I see myself as kind of lucky because while it wasn't great being by myself so much, uh, at least before I entered foster care, a survival technique that allowed me to survive that was, you know, I got to just live inside my head. And so I got to imagine worlds and things that were beyond where I currently was. And I think what, we, what I'm t asking all of you is to join me in this, uh, you know, imagining. I want you all to imagine a world without the need of foster care. I don't think that's very possible right now, but I would love for you to think about what that might mean. And because that's the reality for your kids and the reality that I want for most kids and for really all of them. Uh, but really the challenge is, is that the way that we approach foster care is a little backward. You know, I would ask them that you imagine foster care and the foster care system really being, you know, as like a person, uh, you know, if someone broke their arm, uh, you know, we make a cast to reinforce the broken limb. We provide medicine, time, and resources to heal. And we only consider, you know, cutting off the limb if it's the, the last choice we possibly could have. But yet for so much of the foster care system and so much of the child welfare system, it is our first response is to separate children from their families. And it's a wound that will never heal. Even when it's absolutely necessary, even when it must happen, is one that should be done with incredible amount of care and incredible amount of thought into the risk and the challenges that are going to be presented. And so I firmly believe that if children matter, then families must also matter. And if we believe that it takes a village to raise a child, then also takes a village to fail one. And frankly, we have failed. So the challenge that we must face right now is how do we build that better village? And I think the challenge most importantly is that the system is oriented on the helpers, not on those who are, you know, those we are trying to help. Uh, we need to ensure that as few kids enter the system by investing in families healing. And in the rare cases where kids must enter care, we need to make sure that, that they can come out whole. And so fosters deserve to dream of a better future, one in which we could hope for more than just surviving. And so I would encourage folks to think about things like you know, extending foster care to age 24. So we don't just, you know, drop young people at 18 or 21 and give them homelessness as a gift for their birthday uh, and create a runway to support those who are leaving the state's care. You know, additionally, I would ask folks to monitor and ensure that there's a successful launch of the Ombudsperson for Foster Youth that was passed just this past year. Uh, and there are multiple, you know, positions serving parents, but this would be the first one ever to serve youth. And lastly, I think we need to you know, acknowledge that there can never be a rectifying of the harms of separation, but we can make Minnesota's promise as good as Foster's potential. So thank you. Mr. Murphy, thank you so much. Um, and you talked a lot about your own experience, but I know that you work with many young people um, who've experienced foster care uh, through your work through Foster Advocates. And I appreciate you kind of distilling a lot down in a very short amount of time there. Um, members, we can take a few questions or comments for Mr. Murphy. Um, we do have um, October Allen will be speaking as well. We can also have some questions discussion after that. Uh, so there's a bit of time. So I want to see if folks have um, uh, anything that they would like to ask or say now, just looking for that. Um, I may just, I may ask some, ask you something, Mr. Murphy, that, that um, I found maybe a tiny bit confusing or just want to, you made the comment at the end, you said, you said that we should continue uh, foster care, allow it to possibly continue later than age 18, recognizing uh, that, you know, for so many young people, they turn 18 um, and then, you know, they're, they're out and sort of expected to be on their own. Um, that feels like that could be in some conflict, though, with you saying, hey, foster care is, uh, I, I'm paraphrasing you, it's such a mess. Um, there has kind of so many harms that it potentially imposes. Sometimes it could even be, uh, the cure could be worse than the, than the disease. 
Um, can you just sort of help me reconcile that? But sort of if it's somebody might say simplistically, well, boy, if it's so bad, why, why would you want to continue at age 24? Um, maybe a dumb question, but hopefully you can help. Hopefully it helps you kind of shed a little more light for those of us who are not so familiar with this area. Ms. Murphy. Thank you, Chair Pinto. No, I really appreciate that uh, question. I think there's, uh, like with all challenging systems, there are contradictions uh, with so much of the child welfare system. The reason why things are so terrible is because there are no good choices. We cannot simply leave children to be harmed or to die, like in my scenario, but we're really good at saving them in that moment. We're not so good at raising children and caring for them. Uh, you know, the reality is that my brother and I had the chance to re-enter foster care. My brother did from our adoptive family when he was 15 and I was 16. And the devil I knew was just better than the devil I didn't. But the challenge here is that, you know, foster care was so harrowing and so difficult that so many young people, uh, you know, have so little choices about their lives, including, you know, not even having access to a closet to get changed in the middle of the day. Um, you know, I experienced foster homes where the cabinets were locked and the fridge was locked. It was not a place that was welcoming me and a place where my choices mattered. But then all of a sudden at age 18, we're told you're an, an adult now. Go make you know, good choices. Go figure it out. And there's no network. There's no support. Uh, there's no one to ask and say, hey, do you even have a job lead? Um, you know, I swept uh, the shop at the local scrapyard, um, you know, over the summers. Uh, and that's not a viable job, but it's the only one that I had access to uh, for most of my time in high school. Uh, there are just so many challenges that are being faced that young people have little else. But the reason why folks might want to do extend foster care, which is supposed to be available for folks who are aging out of system from 18 until they turn 21, um, there are requirements and that you have to stay 50% employed, so 80 hours a week. Uh, or be in school for an equal amount of time. Uh, the challenge around that is the second you are not meeting those requirements, you can be kicked off of foster care uh, immediately. Uh, and so I think there's some significant challenges to that, but also different counties have different approaches, but some counties are extremely restrictive and uh, you know do not let young people dictate the terms of their own life. Uh, we've had young people who wanted to move into their dorms and were told that they, they could not do that. Uh, because they were going to have a single dorm. They had to live with other people, uh, which I find to be really challenging. And it's, you know, I think it says a lot that young people at such a high rate do choose to not take extended foster care. You know, it's a f benefit that is about $900 a month. And so if young people would rather be homeless, I think that's damning on the system. And so I think we really just need to make opportunities better for young people. I hope that answers your question a little bit, Chair. Oh, Chair Pinto, I think you might be on mute. I am, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I know that did answer the question. I appreciate it. One thing I want to ask you to do is um, if you could gather together some basic information uh, about, I know that there's just staggeringly high rates of uh, homelessness and other negative outcomes for, for young people exiting out of the foster care system. I know you have that very much at your fingertips. If you could could provide that to um to, to Mr. Fennec to get out to uh, task force members, I think that'd be that'd be helpful information. Um I'm just gonna see, I don't see other hands right now. What I'm inclined to do is to move on to Ms. Uh, Allen, um, but stick around on Mr. Murphy and it may be that we um, have further discussion or questions, um, but I but I really appreciated uh, your uh, your comments, and I, I would assume that other members did as well. Um, so uh, October Allen, if we can have you, and please introduce yourself, and please proceed with your testimony. And then again, members will have questions and discussion with both um, both of these folks to the extent you want to once they're done. But um, October Allen, please uh, dive in. Thank you, Co-Chair Pinto. Um, hello, everyone. My name is October Allen, and uh, I just thought I thought I would share a fun fact. Um, I'm at, I'm the uh, current State of Minnesota Mother of the Year, um, so it is really important. Congratulations. To, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, I wasn't planning on sharing that, but I I think it was important today to show. Um, what people with lived experience can do and what with the power of their testimony and the passion that they have in serving and create an opportunity for people that wouldn't normally have that chance. Um, 
So um, I work for an organization called Minnesota One Stop for Communities, and we are a, a parent mentor program that helps parents that have open child protection cases navigate through their um, child protection case, help them with resources, connect them to services in the community in hopes that they would reunify. Um, the way that I obtain this position was with my lived experience. And, and I had uh, an open child protection case myself. Um, I struggled with substance abuse and, um, and I also grew up in foster care. So um, at the age of 12, my, my mother had an alcohol problem and I was removed from the home. We lived in a very rural community on an Indian reservation. And this was back in like the early 90s where um, there wasn't very much education or awareness to the lack of services or resources in rural areas. And so, um, so I never got, I never went home. I grew up in foster care. I even entered the juvenile justice system. And then as an adult, when I was able to speak to my mother, I asked her, I said, mom, why didn't I ever get to go home? And she said, I didn't know that you could. And I, I am truly um, just a strong believer in if we are able to provide more resources and, and opportunities for parents at home to keep the child in the home, that um, there would be a larger amount of kids, you know, not out of the home. And so I, um, I just want to state uh, one statistic. And in, in 2019, substance use um, was the reason for 48% of children placed in out-of-home care in the state of Minnesota. And as I reviewed the OLA report, um, one of the key recommendations by DHS was um, for DHS and the judicial branch uh, to continue efforts to improve the provision and services offered to families to prevent child removals. And so um, going forward with like my life and successfully reunifying with my children, um, one of the things that helped me in my own success was I had to learn a lot of um, things the hard way. I had to really be resourceful because there wasn't a lot of um, assistance in, you know, in, in my community. And so um, when I began working with parents and helping them navigate through their case plan, I, I really taught them um, and mentor them in the ways of um, being resourceful for themselves and, and mainly working on their recovery. Okay, substance use is, is huge and there's a correlation between substance use, foster care, um, incarceration, homelessness, um, and it's, it's an epidemic. And um, so alongside my work as a parent mentor, I also um, created a program up here in Duluth is where I live. And I'm the owner and the executive director of an organization called Grace Place. And uh, Grace Place is a housing and support program for single women um, that are homeless, that battle with mental health and substance use issues. And we have, um, we have 16 homes in the city of Duluth here. Our program is amazing. We have staff and uh, the, the percentage of people that make it um, are, is very high. And what I have found is these individuals that come into the program that they're single without their children. What do they have? They have stories of um, their children being in foster care and not having the support or, or ability to reunify. And so um, I wanted to speak to that because what else I have found is with Grace Place, we've been able to use that place as um, a home to assist parents with reunification plans. So our preference is to take moms that are in treatment, drug and alcohol treatment, um, they come into our program, we work with them as a parent mentor or peer recovery specialist. And we house them, support them, assist them with all of their recovery needs. And um, then we advocate for them in the court. And Grace Place is then a place, a safe place where kids can begin visiting with their parents. And so we have had many, um, 
many cases, many families that have reunified in the home, in the program. And it's just, it speaks to um, the hope that there is. If parents are supported properly, they have people with lived experience that can relate to them um, and are very knowledgeable of the resources that are in the community. Um, they, they do better and they're supported better and kids are happier. And when kids and families are happier, our communities are happier and healthier. And so one thing that I want to close with is um, the organization Minnesota One Stop, DHS has asked us to partner with, um, oh, what was it? Uh, Morrison County, Portland, Oregon. We're doing this thing to, um, we're partnering. It's a pilot program that's going to be researched and it's to build evidence on recovery support for parents involved in the child welfare system. And so we are specifically, this is like groundbreaking, you guys. I don't think you even have heard about this yet, but um, our job in the next three years is to partner with child welfare agencies, counties, and the early intervention unit to find out what families are struggling, what families are being um, investigated, and how we can go into the home, provide all of these services, resources, and mentorship to parents to um, speak to that um, only report recommendation. Um, and I just, I really believe that it's gonna be revolutionary and um, it's gonna, it's going to be amazing for the state. Yeah. Ms. Ella, thank you for your for your uh, your comments of sharing your perspective. Um, I don't know that I'd realized you had an experience yourself uh, as a child in the child welfare system, and then the experience as a parent, um, and then now you are Minnesota's you say mother of the year. Was that what you said? Yep. If okay. you Google my name, you'll see I'm the state of Minnesota's <laughs> mother of the year. <laughs> well, that is an amazing journey and congratulations to you. And that's, that's just, just wonderful and, uh, and incredible. Um, I just, uh, that's, that's just terrific. Um, members, uh, seeing if there are questions, uh, uh, from task force members or, uh, or otherwise. Um, and, uh, I guess I did want to ask Ms. Allen if, um, uh, just, I'm just thinking about that link of you, have experienced uh, what you did as a child and being in the system and then as a parent, are there, um, I don't know, are there particular connections or things that jump out at you, um, uh, as you as you reflect on being in those dual roles in the system and then now having made it through to be in this position of, of, um, of uh, Mother of the Year that you would want those of us who now are going to be wrapping up our introductory review and really need to dive in deep um, that you want to have us, is there sort of one key point, for example, that you'd want us to, to have in mind as we're, as we're assessing things? One key point, I always go back to the, to the idea of, um, my own mother, you know, I got my, I got my kids back and uh, actually every woman in my family has had a, a open child welfare case. And I was the only one that reunified. And I often think, um, you know, of my mom. She, she didn't even know that she could. And, um, and so I think it's important to always let parents know that there is a possibility. There is such a systematic fear and um, a defense when um, trauma is brought into the home and children are taken out that they, they don't believe anything. They're um, full of mistrust and there needs to be people like us that say, no, it is possible. It absolutely is possible, and here are the steps to take it, or take, and uh, reunification and recovery um, is, is and can be awesome. Ms. Allen, thank you so much. Um, that's a really, really helpful perspective. Um, members um, looking to see if there are any hands. Um, I want to make sure before I forgot, I meant to say this at the end of Mr. Murphy's um, statement, that I'm going to keep in mind uh, his comment that we are, and to paraphrase a bit, we're much better at saving in the moment, the child in the moment, than we are at providing that support to raise the child in, in the longer term. I think that's such a critical point. And I think that we as task force members need to be keeping that very much, keeping that very, very much in mind. So um, I'm not seeing further hands uh, raised uh, members for, uh, for either uh, Ms. Allen or for um, Mr. Murphy. Really appreciate both of you. Um, I know that um, my vice chair, uh, Representative Moran, they want to make a comment. I don't know if, if it was specific to these two speakers um, or broadly, because I think otherwise, members, that we are pretty much um, pretty much done. But Representative Moran, I'll, I'll call on you in that case. 
if you're uh, you can hear me. I know, I know that you had wanted to be. Or um, did we perhaps? Perhaps I lost you. I'm not seeing you. I'm not seeing you currently on. Okay. I know Representative Moran had wanted to to make a comment, we but we may have lost her. Um, so, um, members, uh, uh, thanks for your attentiveness over these hearings, I guess, in, in June, August, and September now. Um, the plan, it seems to me that um, we've had a couple comments today that really reinforced the hearing from the, from the OLA on <laughs> Senator Johnson. Chair Johnson, I think that does sure seem like probably the next order of business. Um, but uh, do you have comments about kind of where you're, you're going to be chairing the next hearing and kind of where we go from here? Please. Sure. Thank you, and, and thank you for your work today, too. That was really a, a fascinating meeting uh, from the beginning all the way through. So appreciate those who came and, and did the work uh, testifying and preparing your statements for this as well. It's really a, a great time uh, to understand our system better and, and some of the needs that we have in there. Yeah, as Representative Pinto said, we've, we've done a pretty good interview or overview of the system, of course, it's all been very, very high level. We do have several points, I think, that we can be delving into as well uh, at this point. But the OLA, I think, is is definitely a good place to uh, start looking at. At this point, maybe we'll have to get together, uh, by, uh, co-chair, and just look and see what a plan of attack we could have on that OLA report and the timeline. I know from here to... Uh, later in November, I know it's harder for folks to kind of get together just because of some of the activities that are going on behind the scenes, which uh, we do need to pay attention to, to uh, in our districts as well. So, um, you know, let's get back together. We'll circle around and see exactly what dates will work for folks uh, and how that's going to turn out um, at that point. That sound, uh, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and yeah, we'll get, uh, we'll kind of see. I think our original plan had been to have a couple of summer hearings and then probably then have a hearing at the end of the of the calendar year. Um, I suspect that we may still be on track for that, that our next hearing wouldn't be until November or December. But um, but uh, we'll be in touch about that. Of course, you'll be the one to call it. We'll get that figured out. I just want to see if there are members, uh, anything further from folks. Um, uh, raise hands. I don't see Representative Moran back. Uh, uh, Representative Moran's actually waiting to rejoin, so staff can keep an eye out for her and let her back in. Um, I'd appreciate that. Um, I want to encourage members of the public who are watching this. If you have suggestions for us as to things that we should work on, uh, please send it to uh, Senator Johnson and me. Um, you want to see CCR, CCR staff members, um, uh, Paul uh, and Senator Johnson, oh, Paul Carlson and the Polycer Clinic, uh, and send us recommend, uh, uh, suggestions that you may have. Um, and I think we may have Representative Moran back in, I'm hoping at this point. Um, I am not seeing her. Just give me a second, folks. So, oh, yes, she is. So Representative, Representative Moran, you are in. And uh, we are just about to wrap up, but I noted earlier that you had a comment that you wanted to make. Um, and so uh, you'll, you'll get to, I think, have the, have the last word, Representative Moran. Hope we have you. Representative Moran, do we have you? I can see you on the screen, but uh, but don't have you on camera okay. or, or on camera. Okay, can you hear there me now? Can yes. you hear me? Oh, yep. beautiful. Oh, okay. I had lost connection here. But I just want to kind of like um, speak a little bit to what I heard, but also state that, uh, you know, as we reflect on why the Governor Task Force on Child Protection were created and why we moved over to the Legislative Process uh, Task Force and... Um, and what I've been hearing from uh, the, the, uh, the testifiers. And so, um, in, in what I've been hearing is that we need to create more of a sprint-based type of child care system that supports children and family, you know, and do some prevention. Um, and I know that because of the disproportionate number of African-American children who have been removed from uh, from their families, from their communities, and the trauma that we have imposed on the child during that process. And I hope that we can just keep in mind how we want to, you know, prevent or alleviate the trauma that, is ha that happens when we remove children from everything that they know that is close to them and focus on the family dynamic of placing them with family. Um, and I do still want to reference the work that's been done by the Casey Foundation that would reference 
when ICWA was testifying in that it is my hope through my bill that I, when I introduced the African-American Family Preservation Act, that we can have an active effort for all children, right? We need to have those active efforts. So uh, Ms. York, uh, I hope that we can find a process that we can utilize that word active effort to really encompass all the children in the child welfare system. Um, Mr. Murphy, um, I heard from him there was a lack of hope as uh, children are removed from their homes. And we want to never do that to children that, so that they are feeling hopeless. That we have a foster care system that is, you know, that has not been, but we're moving into more of a supportive type of system. So support services for families is critical in this process, not always to remove to place in with foster parents, but how can we support those families, right, who are in those crises at that, mo at, um, at that moment. And so I wanna uplift and say congratulations to Ms. Allen, October Allen as being mother of the year. That is awesome. And the work that she has done in partnership with community caring for children, which really is a parent mental, mental parent mental services for those who have been impacted by the child welfare system who can come to the table about how we can strengthen that system i like to say that community care is a bill that introduced into the legislature so you guys can hear them see them and know the work and the value that they have in stabilizing parents and families and community and that we continue to work through a lens like the work that they are doing and they do in partnership with DHS, because it really is how do we remove the trauma that has been imposed by the system that was supposed to care and love children. And unfortunately, you know, it doesn't always end up that way. Not in every case, of course, but we want to help that type of prevention supportive lens going forward. I'm a little bit sad that I won't be in the legislature um, next session. So I'm speaking my piece right now. Because, <laughs> because we want to continue to build on the, on, in the direction that we have been going in since the governor task force and since many of the recommendations have been um, passed into law. But we have to continue to invest in some of that investment policy, but we have to use dollars to, to move uh, a system that is trying to wrap some service around and be a strict based system that is looking at the whole child and the whole family and the whole community. And so that's my little part that I leave you with as we move further into what that looks like in 2023. Thank you. Thank, thank, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rand. Many of us are sad you, you, you won't be in the legislature too. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, I was figuring there, there would be at least one more hearing before the end of your term at the end of December was planning to to, uh, to, to make note of you um, at that point, too, because you've been such an incredible leader in this space. Um, members, I just want to highlight and appreciate Representative Moran highlighting um, the need to, to strengthen families um, and, uh, and the concerns, the, the, the idea that when families have um, food and shelter and the basics, um, that really is going to help make their kids be um, better off, too. And I feel like that's something we sort of started with back in June, and, and it's maybe a nice way to end um, as well to be sure that, of course, what we want is the welfare of kids, not in just in that moment, but um, but all the way along. Um, so, Representative Moran, thank you so much for those comments. Um, members not seeing any other hands, I really appreciate uh, your attentiveness through these meetings, and uh, we'll look forward to the next one when, uh, when Chair Johnson is, uh, is chairing. And I believe with that, um, members, we are adjourned. Thanks so much to everybody. Appreciate it.